everyone like wants to know when you're going to talk about money in the church. Today's the day. So I'm glad we have a house full because if you knew we were going to talk about money, you would have not come. <clears throat> Am I right? Because we don't like to talk about money. We don't like to talk about money at church. So today we did a sneak attack. We came around the back. We flanked you. And now you're stuck. Doors are locked. People are, you know, you're done. You're done. For 30 more minutes, you have to listen to me. <clears throat> I'm going to start off first by um, welcoming Central Christian Church. Um, they're here with us in our service today. And if you did, didn't recognize some people, they may be them. We appreciate you all joining us. Um, their pastor, Lanny, had an emergency in his home. His, his mother passed away. So he is dealing with that. And um, they asked if they could join us. And I'm like, yeah. Um, so they're here. Thank you so much for joining us. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever tried this, but hopefully you haven't. Have you ever tried to focus on <clears throat> two things at one time? Anyone? Maybe if they were close together, you could, but the more they, they come apart, it's, it's virtually impossible to focus on two things at one time. I mean, if you want to follow your fingers and try to do that, your eyes will look really weird, and someone will take your picture and put it on Facebook or something. You don't want that because you look really bad. So the thing, it's kind of simple that we focus on one thing at a time, and, and it's the same way in our Christian Life. We should always keep our focus on one thing, which is a Sunday school answer. Everybody ready? God. That's who we keep our focus on. And when we keep our focus on God, it allows us to look vertically and not horizontally. Not at people, not at um, our problems. It, it keeps our focus up like this. And so today, it's more about our focus and less about what you have in your wallet. And hopefully... Some of you are maybe squirming. You shouldn't really feel that uncomfortable today. I promise uh, you'll be fine, okay? You may not be next week, but today you're okay. We should always keep our focus on God. And today, as we talk about money, I know that up front, it, it does make you feel a little uncomfortable. I realize that. No one likes to talk about money all the time. It gives us a headache. It gives us a migraine. It's like, can we just not go watch a movie or go eat ice cream? Let's stop talking about money. And I said it, I've said it from the pulpit, I'm saying it, I'm talking about it. The whole sermon is about money. And it's, it's the, the problem is not money. The problem is our heart. And that's where we need to focus today. You know, money, as we all know, can, it enables us to do a lot of things, does it not? I mean, everything you are able to do is because of the money you have. Everything that you are not able to do is because of the money you don't have. Isn't that fun to talk about and think? It's like all the things I can't do because I have, you know, this house and this car and these children and this dog. And, you know, I mean, it's just kind of gets a little crazy when we start talking about money. So we just need to kind of calm down and move forward with this. You know, money is a tool. So the question is really, what are we using money for? It's like if you're building something and you need a hammer, it's like making it about the hammer and not about what you're building. Does that make sense? It's like I'm so focused on the hammer and, you know, the nails are secondary and this fence is secondary. I'm just so focused on the hammer, I can't even build the fence. And that's how we get with money. It's like we, we are so focused on it and fixated on it, and it controls us so much that we forget it's the tool that enables us to do other things in life. So the question is, is what are you using your money for? And the, <clears throat> the thing I love to say, and I really believe, is nobody has a right to judge you for your money. What you have, what you don't have, what you give, what you don't give. That is for you and God to deal with. And we can ignore God in every area of our life, and we can ignore Him in the area of finances if we want. But that's the only person you need to answer to with your finances. You need to be on a, a good communication level with Him, but we, nonetheless, that's who we need to consider when we're talking about it. And throughout the Bible, money is talked about a few times, okay? It is talked about a lot. So money matters. Money matters to God. Did you realize that there are over 8 
800 scriptures dealing with money in the Bible. 800 scriptures. It's talked about a lot. Jesus talked about money more than he talked about heaven and hell. I have to wrap my mind around that. I think because heaven and hell is one decision. Accepting Christ or not. Money is about every day of our life and decisions we have. Um, It's talked about more than anything else except for the kingdom of God. One in every seven verses in the Gospel of Luke is about money. And 11 of the 39 uh, parables are about money. So Matthew 6.24 says this, No one can serve two masters. No one can focus on two things. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Serving money means it's not a tool. Okay? Tools don't rule over you. Tools you use. It is not a master. So I want to focus on money as it pertains to all of us. You know, if I were to ask you, what would you do with more money? I bet you you could come up with a list, couldn't you? I mean, would that be kind of easy? It could be necessities. It could be wants. It could be other people's needs. But let's think about that. If you just walked out of here and I I put on there $500, but that goes fast, right? So let's say you found like $15,000, all right? You just found it, and it's yours. You can't turn it in anywhere. You can't be the good Samaritan. Like, you know, it's yours, okay? What are the things that pop in your head that you would use that money for? Let's think about it. Kids, your kids, would you use some of it? Was that, would that maybe be the first thing? Maybe it's not. I'm not judging. I'm just, like, my kids are fine. <clears throat> I'll give them a quarter. I don't want to give me a new car. You know, but we'd need like $75,000 for that. But um, how about your spouse? So we're like, oh yeah, there's that person in my <clears throat> Would you buy them a gift? Maybe it's something they wanted and you're like, I can't afford that. Maybe it's bills. <laughs> yeah, maybe, Derek, really? Yeah, it would be bills. You might pay some things off with that money. How about a vacation? The vacation you've always wanted. Yeah, we're going to Hawaii, you know, tomorrow. I quit, you know, and go and then <clears throat> maybe you would save it. Maybe give it to the church. Only 10%, Derek. You know, I, I don't give 10%, but if I got a lot of money, I would only give 10%. So um, <clears throat> maybe missions, maybe an orphanage, maybe you've heard about something in, down the street in another country, and you're like, oh, yeah, I would bless them. Think about it. What would you spend that money on? That's kind of fun to talk about, right? Kind of like the Powerball. <laughs> Everybody had plans. Whether you bought a ticket or not, or 500 tickets, you had a plan. Man, if I had that money. And we all heard it, right? It's like, boy, do we have a plan for money. So let's think for a minute. As Jesus talked about money so much, we know he talked about it so often because it was so important to him. Because he knows it's important to us. He knows it is in every fabric. It's woven in the fabric of our lives, money. And I'm not, so here's my thought process today. Some of you are like, oh, there's a catch to this. There's not. Okay. I thought about it, but I'm like, no, I can't do that. So I'm not asking for money today. All right? I'm not manipulating you for more money. I'm not requesting. I'm not petitioning. I, I, I necessarily don't want you to give more than you wanted to give today at church because we're talking about money. And if you weren't planning on giving, then don't give. That's the thing about giving to the church or your offering or helping someone out, it's about you and God. It's not about that entity. It's not about that individual. It's about your heart. It's about what you feel God is leading you to give and to do. Period. That's it. So you need to remember that. You know, from God's standpoint, I want us to understand money. And then I want us to go and pray and discuss what He wants us to do with His money. Because, man, we get money, it becomes our money, doesn't it? I work for it. I got up early for it. I put up with my boss for it. I put up with the employees for it. I put up with the customers. It's my money now. It's not yours. It's no one else's. I worked hard for it. It's my money. And we don't want to think about it as God's money. It's not God's money. It's my money. 
I didn't see God working out here for that. We get very, very edgy about money. I know this because I do, right? So I, I, I'm not saying you do and I don't. It, it's for all of us. We'll talk about anything with other people, but we won't talk about money with other people, right? How many people know how much money you make? How many people know how much you spend on certain things? Nobody. It's none of their business, but it's God's business, okay? We need to understand that. He allows us to decide. You know, God gives us everything we want, and He allows us to decide what we do with everything He gives us. Do you realize that? He doesn't demand you use your talent. You may be like the phenom singer of the universe. You may could win the voice and all that, and you don't even sing up here. That's your choice. That's, God gave you that talent, but you don't have to use it. God gave you all of this, these things in life, but He gives you the freedom to do anything you want to with it. Period. That's how He's created us. He wants us to do things for Him out of love, out of a desire of our heart, out of the passion of our heart, out of the heart the you speak. It's the outflow of what's going on. That's what's most important. And just because you can do anything doesn't mean you should do anything. Have you realized that in life? I think Paul said something about that. I, I can do anything I want, but I choose not to. So I can live for Christ. It's like, you know, you get a car. I, I think I was driving the other day with my daughter, and um, it's been a while, but she's like, how fast does this car go, Dad? I'm like, you want to see? No, it's okay. <laughs> I tried it. Um, <laughs> shh, don't tell him. I'm like, it says 120 on the speedometer, 140. She goes, holy cow, it'll go that fast. I'm like, I don't know, it might. So, you know, all our cars have the speedometer that goes way over the speed limit. Does that mean we can just drive around town and in parking lots at 120 miles an hour? Like, whoa! And teenagers are like, yeah, that's what it means. No, it's not. Do not give them a car, all right? Please. Give them a little moped with a little governor that you're like, it's already my... You know, <clears throat> but it doesn't mean you do that. You can, but you don't. You'll kill someone. Someone you'll die. I mean, something bad will happen. You'll run into the church or McDonald's or you know, you, bad things happen. So just because God gives you this life and gives you these talents and gives you this money and gives you these finances doesn't mean that you can do whatever you want to with it. That's not what it's about. Just because you have the money doesn't mean you spend it all on yourself. So we see the point. You know, money, again, is this touchy subject. So I want to give you a, kind of an illustration to prove that point, all right? So I, somebody's like, what's in the bag? You know, I'm like, I'm not telling what's in the bag. So um, it's from Albertson. So, so let's, let's think of a story, all right? I'm going to tell a little funny story here. Have, has anyone ever taken a child to a sports game? Anybody? Have you been to anything with a child? Raise your hand. At some point, there you go, everybody. All right, you're like, I'm not sure the question. Okay, the movie, the baseball game. I don't care, the mall. We walk by and the kids are like, gumball, can I have gumball? You know, I'm like, jeez, we just ate, we just had ice cream, but here's a quarter, give you gumball. So, so let's say you take them to the baseball game and they're like, I want, you know, it's like the most important part of the game, right? That's when it happens. I'm hungry. I, I want a snack. I'm like, geez, what do you want? And they're like, oh, I don't care, just um, M&M. So like, I just picked this candy because that's what they have back there. So I'm like, okay. So I run. I miss the game, right, that I want to see. The kid doesn't care about the game. Most of the times I don't. But you go get the $20, you know, thing of M&Ms that you can get at the church for 50 cents, I think. So um, you get them the M&Ms, right? And you sit back down. You're like, here's the M&Ms. And they're like, they open it. Obviously, I'm not going to eat this because I can't, so... So you're like, okay, they open it, and they're just chowing on M&M's, and you're like, M&M's sound pretty good. And you're like, can I, can I have an M&M? And they're like, <laughs> why can't I? I just want one. I'm not like, I don't want the whole bag. You know, I just want one. I don't care what color it is. I know you do. You eat them in a, you know, sequential order or whatever. I just want one, one little M&M. They're like, no, these are my M&M's. I said I want M&M's. 
you got them and you put them in my hand. That makes them my M&Ms. And I'm not sharing one M&M with you. So they're like, no. What's funny about that? We've all experienced that. Can I have a piece of popcorn? Can I have a drink of your Coke? Get your own Coke. You paid for that, you can go get you another Coke. What they don't understand is I could have got them a bunch of M&Ms, right? I mean, if I wanted to, I could have, this is not smart financial decision, but I could go get my credit card and buy the whole concession stand, right? I mean, I could have just like went crazy and then I'd have filled the bag up and just poured all the M&Ms on them like, how you like me now? <laughs> right? We can do that. But all I asked for was one M&M. And they were so selfish. They're like, hey, that should be good with the Lord's Supper later. All right. So you can have a choice. Just joking, Tyler. I didn't pay for those. So uh, those are for the youth to go to camp. Or, I don't know what they do with that money, but there's a lot of it. So here's the point. You see, when it comes to God and his money and his talent that he gives you, we become like selfish little children. He's provided all of these things for us. And he's like, okay, it's time to give back to me. And we're like, "Mm -mm." all we're doing is being a selfish child. We're not being mature in our faith. And it's okay to be that way when you're five. And it's, it's funny when we're talking about M&Ms, right? It's hilarious when our kids do that. They all have done it. I've done it when I was a kid. You're not getting my candy. But then we teach them how to grow out of it to where they're like, you ask for one here and have a handful. Because they understand who you are. They understand what you could do and can do and have done and will do for them. That's a child that's matured. So it's not bad to be there at some point in your life. It's bad to stay there the rest of your life. Most people say, man, if I had a million dollars, if I had $1.4 billion, what I couldn't do for my family, my friends, my little church on, you know, Mitchell and 14th, man, I just like, there you go. Buy whatever you want. Have smoke and hazes and lights and, you know, you could just stained glass this whole thing, (laughs) plexiglass that and, you know, have the best of this and hire a better pastor because he's crazy and, you know, I'm like, just do everything. And we're all like, that would be awesome, yeah. I could help that orphanage that they talk about. I could just build them, I could pay for every child and bring them here. And that would be like, that's awesome. Let me read you a a verse. Luke 12, 48. Everyone to whom much has given of him, much will be required. And from him to everything they entrust much, they will demand the more. You know, Jesus wants to bless you. I believe that. This isn't prosperity gospel. He wants to expand your influence. He wants to entrust you with much. But it will not happen if we're not faithful in the things now. So we, we sometimes live in the future and not the here. Well, when I get this, I'll do this. Instead of what I have now, I'll do this. And I've heard it said in this book my small group just went through. I believe, I, I'm weird about books. I read them, but I read like five at a time. It's weird. Not like open, but like I'll read a few pages and I'll change books and read this one. And I'll, that was good. And I'll read. So I think it was in the book all in. If some of my small groups here doing this, I'm like, okay, it's in another book. If you really want to know, I'll, I'll find it somehow for you. But it says, giving is not based on how much a person gives, but on how much is left after they've given. That's powerful. It's bigger than the church, you know, let's, let's turn our thoughts and conversation to the church for a moment. You know, does the church need your money? I mean, really, do we need your money? Is someone going to starve tomorrow if you don't give your tithe? No. 
Do you really need to give it to the church? No. Do you have to? No. No one's going to, we're not going to like pass the plate and be like, <clears throat> really, that's it? I don't sit there, I don't know what anyone gives anything. I have no idea, and I don't care. I don't want to worry about it, I want to think about it. I want to do what God's called me to do, and I want someone to do what they're called to do and, and make sure it gets in our account, and we decide where it goes. But let me tell you what it's about. It's not about what you give or how you do it. It's about the obedience, the act of obedience. And I hate that word, obedience, as much as anyone, as much as a five-year-old. Christianity has always been about the act of obedience. It's the obedience in the mundane. It's the obedience when you don't want to. That's obedience. It's the obedience when something is shiny and new. Have you been there? You know what it's like? It's like a fish. Some fish, I'm not, I'm not a fisherman, but I know a little bit about it. I know how I can't, I mean, I go fish, I don't catch a fish. But I used to fish in streams with lures. And they, they spin, spinners. And they, they sparkle as they go through the water. And there's some people that think that a fish attacks it, not because it's hungry, but it's, it's shiny. And they like, what is, you know, they're like, squirrel, you know. And, and then you catch them and they're like, oh, that was a bad, that was not what I thought I was. You know, and they're like, mm. that's how we are usually with things that are, you know, God's like, okay, walk this path. Name it. I don't care. We're not, we can talk about anything. We're not talking about money. We're just walking this path and then there's the shiny thing off the path. And our attention is like, ooh, pretty shiny, you know, and then we go over there and there. And then it's the regret, right? As we're getting reeled in, as, as away from what God wants, away from our obedience, we're like, that was a bad decision. And everybody else beside us and our friends are like, that was stupid. We're like, yeah, I know that. I, you know, oh. All the fish are laughing at that one. <laughs> we knew it was a lure. And like... That's our problem. Obedience should trump everything else. Obedience should control our money. So my question today is, where, what are you obedient to? Where is your treasure? Luke 12, and there's the whole verse, but I'm going to read the last statement of verse 34. says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. See, that's, it's not about anything but our heart. You know, I think... Personally, if I would have played the Powerball and I would have won the Powerball, I think I would have had the biggest internal struggle of my life. But I don't know how long it would have lasted, but it would have been difficult. I mean, think about that. Because we all know what money can do in this world, right? It's power. It can change lives. It can ruin lives. It's a tool. A hammer can build things or it can kill someone. It depends whose hand it's in. So let's check our hearts this morning. That's what I want us to do. And let's take a moment to focus our attention and our thoughts and our vision vertically on God. You know, this is the God who saves. This is the God who changes hearts. Have you experienced that? Have you been praying that he would? Yours? Someone else's? The God who is patient with us. Right? Give me the M&M. It's the parent that doesn't like, well, you're never getting any M&Ms again. Give them, you know, and taking them away from them and like, I'll never buy you M&Ms. And then it's three years later, can I have an m M&M? No, you can't have an m M&M. Remember that time you... We've all been, I mean, crazy parents. Okay, we've been those and we've seen them, so we don't have to go. But he's patient. Let's focus on him as we kind of move into communion. All right, so we're going to get the band up here. We're going to sing. We're going to get the guys up here. This is probably a bad idea. Hold on. Not guys yet. Stealing from the youth. Okay, now the guys are coming up. I see them coming up. They were excited about the M&Ms. 
So we're going to have this time. And I, what I want to do is we're going to... I'm going to take mine. So. We're going to disperse those. I want you to hold them, sing, listen, um, lament. But I want us to focus on the change. You know, in the Bible, talking through communion, it, it says... Check yourself before you take of this. So this is what this time is for. Let's, let's do that together, and then I'll come up here and read the passage on it. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 25, read as this. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said this is my body, which is for you. And take it and eat it in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. And after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 